What's up, everybody? Welcome to Puzzle Huddle with Experts. I have another fantastic guest, Dr. Jacqueline Orr. She has a doctoral degree in uh, public health, uh, and I'm excited to talk to her. It's my firm belief that everyone with a doctoral degree has an awesome childhood development story, awesome childhood education story. So I'm looking to uncover that, uncover their path, uh, what influenced their education, and, and then learn something about what they're doing right now. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Orr. I'm so glad to have you today. Thank you so much, Matthew. I appreciate it you even reaching out and I'm happy to be here. If you could, to, just to get us all onboarded in terms of where you are, what, what is your professional background and what do you do for a living? So I am, um, I am currently working as a program officer in research evaluation and learning um, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And they are the largest philanthropy um, dedicated to health in the country. And so when I talk about um, research evaluation and learning, it's basically building the evidence base for a lot of the work um, that we do tied to a lot of our programmatic programs and programmatic work. And then we also evaluate that work and then disseminate learning. So um, it's really an opportunity to get um, a lot of the wonderful work that we are supporting out into the field um, in various different ways, given that um, we look at health in a number of different ways. We don't look at it just as like a brick and mortar institution. There are also communities or children and families that have all, um, they are all impacted by health and all of those things are interconnected. So they're various structural barriers um, that could influence health and we're working to try to address those. Yeah, now that's a, that's a pretty high place professionally. So I want to walk back down to your to your childhood and see if okay. we can stair stack our way back back to where you are now. Tell me about your childhood. What might have been some of your favorite like toys and games when you were a kid? So growing up, um, I was the only child. So at my mom's house. So like growing up, there were often times like we had there were a good number of us that lived on the block um, and we would often play outside. But I would say. A lot of my favorite toys, I remember like Sorry, I remember oh, yeah. like oh, Monopoly, yeah. mm -hmm. um, Risk, like the nerd strategist in me is like, I love Risk as like an eight year old. Um, but like family would buy me like a lot of board games and uh, which also would cause me to have people over like, hey, come over, let's play board games. Yeah, so, you can't play by yourself. You can't, <laughs> right. The only things I learned how to play by myself was it's still that Cracker Bear, like that triangle with the um the pegs in it like where you have to like checkers. leave one yeah it's not chinese checkers it's like a um i forgot the name of it but it's like if you leave four you, the goal is to only have one pin okay. on the triangle when you finish and it's that cracker barrel like it's a game that you can play by yourself basically but um those are like strategy games that you learn as a kid and even like books like i I remember, I remember growing up, like there were a lot of like African-American authors that we were reading from like elementary school, like yeah, Paul yeah. Dun Lawrence Dunbar. Oh, um, yeah. I remember reading like, even though I wasn't supposed to be reading this, like the color purple when it came out, it was like <laughs> a big deal, right? Like the, the movie was a big deal. And it was like, well, we got the book. Like, let me start reading the book. And that was just like way too advanced for me. Um, but definitely love like the Babysitter's Club, Judy oh, yeah. Bloom, like, uh -huh. but it's interesting, like, looking back, you know, Scholastica really provided, like, very few people of color that were authors back in the day, but, like, we still, I went to Bates um, Academy for elementary school, K through, uh, well, first through eighth grade, so it was interesting to see that we got, like, a really good balance of, like, African-American authors as well as, like, kind of the, the bubblegum teenager books as well. Yeah, one of my favorite books growing up, probably the earliest book I can remember is a book called Super Fudge. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's a Judy Bloom book. And I, I probably read that book three or four times yep. that, that I can remember. <laughs> yeah, uh, she was, I, I loved her writing. Like, as a kid, that was like one of my getaways for sure. Yeah, now, now to just f fill out this whole sandbox for me, what what did your parents, what was the, what did you have your parents, or what, what did they do for a living to help kind of def more define what your childhood experience was like? Um, so yeah, my, um, my mom is a retired speech pathologist. So she was a speech pathologist in the Detroit public school system Get for over 30 years. Okay. Yeah. And my dad, my dad was in, um, retail management, like hospitality management. So I remember growing up as a kid, like eating church's chicken. Like he used to run all the church's <laughs> chickens in Detroit. So like eating churches with the jalapenos, like that was a whole thing. Yeah. Um, and then he, 
ended up going over to Pizza Hut. And so like a lot of the Pizza Huts that were open up um, in the in the 80s, he was like responsible for those. Um, but he's, he can't, he had a, a space in retail, in the retail management industry. So yeah. Oh, you've, you've blown my mind already with personal insight. <laughs> I, I didn't know I was going to pick up. <laughs> right, fried chicken and Judy Bloom. It's like <laughs> perfect combination, right? <laughs> right? Wow, I can't wait to see what else I get out of it. Uh, <laughs> Now, for this, this this doctoral degree in public health, pull mm-hmm. that back to me into your childhood. How might that have shown up as an early interest for you that that it just kind of continues to blossom over your, your academic career? Yeah, so I think what's interesting about public health is public health really isn't supposed to be seen, right? Like it's it's the mm-hmm. way in which we ensure that populations are healthy and can function in their day-to-day lives. Um, and I really didn't get exposure to public health until probably college, right? But um, growing up, I had grandparents that I was like my maternal grandparents. I was pretty close with, okay. and so I remember the first experience I had kind of with health and healthcare um, that I can remember with my grandmother was she had a stroke. And so the stroke, like not understanding what was happening in the hospital and all of that, like, um, and I remember discussions about like, will her insurance cover things? So there was a discussion about like the delivery of care and ensuring that she would be able to get what she needed after this stroke. Um, And in my mind, I wanted to be a physician. That was the goal. Like I wanted to be a surgeon. Do you remember how close to just roughly? I think that probably started around 12 or 13. Okay. And part of it was like our family and even like a lot of my friends, like we sit and watch sports together. Right. So like I really got drawn into, oh, I could be a surgeon. Like I want to be a doctor, but I could be an orthopedic surgeon. And I could work with all these amazing athletes. But back in the day, like we're talking like early nineties. Right. And so understanding that like, even now the number of orthopedic surgeons that are black women is like a small percentage compared to mm-hmm. white men. But that was a dream of mine. Like I could, I could do this because my love for sports could combine <laughs> with like my love for medicine and there could be an opportunity there. But um, once I got to college, organic chemistry was the eye opener and awakener <laughs> for me that I realized that medical school probably would not be um, where I would end up in my career. So um, just I've had wonderful experiences in schools of public health um, and understanding kind of the mission of those those universities um, and specifically the schools that try to influence the health and well-being of folks is part of the reason why I ended up there. So it's, I think it's one is kind of part of like my personal mission is to help folks and get get us all free, whatever that looks like. If it's healthy, if it's, you know, financially secure, um, that's what it's about. But it's also having the influence and impact and being able to help folks. Um, at a larger scale, which is really important. Now, me now you mentioned your, your grandmother passing as a, a uniquely formative experience. Are there any other things that you can remember from your childhood that, you know, kind of stand out as without this, like this was a thing or a process or experience that really kind of informed my life and put me on a, a specific direction? Were, were there any other activities? Um, yeah, so she had a stroke. She didn't pass away from the stroke, but she just had a stroke. And so we saw... Like I started seeing a lot of things, including like home health care and all of that, that had an influence. So I just wanted to clarify that she hadn't passed from that stroke. Um, But yes, there are like defining moments, I think, in my career or in my childhood, I think. um, As a whole, just I think seeing seeing black folks that look like me. Like I had a black dentist, I had a black doctor like growing mm-hmm. up. So like that wasn't too far fetched to see somebody that looked like me that was a, that was making a difference in the community, right? And that's, I think in the way in which they delivered care and the way that they cared about us, like I know my dentist had hundreds, maybe thousands of, of, of people coming to him, yeah. but he remembered our names. Oh, yeah. He always took the time to talk to us. And that was like, wow, like I could really do that. Like it makes all I, the difference. I never left like, 
I hate the dentist. Like it was always a very warm and welcoming environment. But when, when I originally met you, you were mm-hmm. a, a high school drum major. Yes. How, how did you arrive at that station and position? And what was the path that put you into that leadership role? Oh, that's that's an interesting journey. Shout out to Sharon Allen and Cast Tech Marching Band. Um, I started out playing tenor drum in the marching band. So ninth uh-huh. and 10th grade year, I played tenor drum. Miss Allen had called my mom the summer before we started at CAST to see if I wanted to come to band camp. So I had gone to Bates Academy, like I mentioned in Detroit and um, our music program, shout out to um, Mr. David Berry, who was absolutely amazing. Um, We had, I guess, a reputation for our students actually being able to sight read that kind of thing from Bates. So um, Sharon called my mom, said, Hey, would your daughter be interested in band camp? And I was like, sure, why not? I wasn't doing anything else that summer. Yeah. So I ended up going to band camp, um, playing drums, playing tenor drum for two years. You were recruited for high school band. Well, I, I guess, yes, because I had played drums and yeah, I guess I was like, and, and Miss Allen was probably like, Sharon was looking for folks to, you know, fill out the band. So yeah, I was, I ended up being I guess not, I wasn't recruited in the way I think that probably the kids from A&T, um, Ann Arbor Trail, um, and Spain middle yeah. school were probably, it was probably a different, um, a different approach, but I was asked. Yeah. I'll say I was at least asked to join the marching band. Um, okay. So then you didn't send in film and tape. And no, absolutely not. It was not, <laughs> it was not an audition like that. It was probably, I don't even remember like. I think she automatically put me on tenor drum because like I didn't have chops for real to be on snare anyway, which was, you know, I try, I did try snare like one band camp and it was just like, no, this isn't, this isn't my ministry. So um, there were two, there may have been three, like there were drum majors while when I started um, that Mm -hmm. were absolutely amazing. So um, Erica and Travail, I remember them specifically just being like a dynamic duo erica is probably all of five feet travel is like six foot and it was just like they were amazing and i just remember like that energy and so i have like i i definitely had some training in dance like i grew up dancing right um from like five to 13 and so that was a choice that i had to make too was i going to continue to dance or was i going to be in the marching band i couldn't do both Right. So um, ended up choosing band and um, over time became section leader of the tenor drum section um, and started, I, I just said, Hey, I want to try out. And so it became a, it's not about just being able to dance. Cause I could dance, right? Like, it was like, okay, I understand right. it's not I just could, about dance. My little thing, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I think um, I will honestly say, and I think a lot of people that were, with me around this time, I had one of the like most interesting drum major tryout experiences that lasted more, probably at least a year or more. Um, And I think part of that was, Sharon probably didn't think that I was ready or I didn't have the chops to do it. And so it challenged me to become a better musician, right? Like I play drums, the majority, I played drums, like I, I was a percussionist. Yeah. So even it's it made me step up even in like symphonic band or concert band like learning how to play timpani and all these other things and getting an ear like wow. I had to end up having an ear for like when the trumpets were out of tune or when they when they were trying to play me and be like you know <laughs> they're playing c sharps and we're supposed to be at b flats you know what I mean like even knowing that kind of thing you're like it it challenged me in a very different way and so finally I became drum major, I think so, 11th and 12th grade year. I was drum major for two years. Um, Shout out to the two individuals that were drum major with me. So it was a male and female um, duo each for each of the years that I was there. And also shout out to little Larry, who Larry was probably six when we were, when we were uh, like work, working together. So Larry, like we have a, I have a picture of us from one of the performances that we had um, and Larry is like right there in the front with me. So it was, I mean, it was an interesting experience, but it was, it was very challenging, right? Like I ended up, it was something that I wanted to do, but I had to step up and understand 
parts of like the band that I didn't necessarily have exposure to before. Um, and then also learning how to lead people that are your peers. Some people are yeah, older than right. you too, right? Like older and your friends, right? Right, right. And so that was, it was definitely like a shift. It was definitely a learning experience for me. Um, but looking back, it's like, wow, I did have opportunities as a child. <laughs> like, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of responsibilities. I was working part-time um because we had co-op at CAS. So I had a co-op in the morning and then I would have to come and be like this, you know, leader um in the afternoon for for practice. So yeah, as a whole, it was a really good experience. But it there were like while I was in it, it wasn't it wasn't all that great. It was kind of like a test for sure. But I was able to come out and I have a lot to 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 share. <laughs> about the experience of what I learned. So yeah. yeah. Now, now take me from being a drum major to undergrad and organic chemistry. Well, <laughs> why, why, why did you decide on a STEM major uh, as, as a focus for your undergraduate studies? So I was, I was a business. So at Cass Tech, we had an opportunity to have a major and I was a business major at Cass. Absolutely mm -hmm. love business. Um, but again, like I told you, this dream of being a surgeon was in my head. So yeah, in right. doing research um, and actually one of the saxophone players, shout out to Nicole Perkins, Nicole, now Nicole Thompson. Um, Nicole was one of the first people that I knew from Detroit that I had a relationship with that went to Xavier University of Louisiana. Okay. And so in talking to Nicole, she was like, if you want to be a doctor, you need to come here. And so I started doing the research. And so from that, there were actually a few of us that ended up going um, to Xavier. So I was chemistry pre-med, um, was accepted into the program. Um, and the first year was an adjustment. Like, First semester, I did really well. Second semester, I like did not do well at all. <laughs> Ended okay. up having, um, I think I had more hours than I should have. And it was springtime in New Orleans. So it was a lot going on. Yeah, right. Some social yeah. opportunities. Yeah, <laughs> social opportunities for sure. And then organic chemistry was in my second year. And so there, it was just, it wasn't clicking for me. And so like, for me, I had to take another assessment of like, okay, is this something that I want to continue to fight with <laughs> over and over again, or do I just need to get through it? And so I ended up getting through the course, but I realized that if I'm having hard, a hard time in organic, there's going to be a lot of difficulty when it comes to like being in medical school and trying to reach, you know, certain curves and all of that like I was like that's a lot to consider so I ended up shifting my major from pre-med to environmental chemistry so I still stayed in chemistry I just didn't have as many biology courses yeah um and then once you get past organic some of the chemistry like for me at least got a little bit easier so yeah you, looking back at your time Xavier what were some of your, your favorite college experience like what, what 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 were the good things that happened wow um the friends, like I, I still have like lifelong friends that I met while being down there. And so Xavier is probably the same size as Cass was when I graduated. So about 3,500 wow. people was a fairly small school, but massive impact in the country. So I would say like my friends also, um, there was, there were probably 10 of us that started a, um, a pom pom squad. So they had a dance team, but they're, they were very formal and um, they had a much more formal training and you could tell like everybody oh, this, was this like dance is really in you this is not like yeah. just like no two step in the mirror no it's like... not it's, dance is really in me like the arts is the whole thing for sure I, I love I absolutely love the arts and so we ended up starting a pomeret like a pom-pom team which was a little bit more like many of us had been trained in dancing but it was like a little bit like lighter um we use booty shake music and like house music like yeah. incorporated because many of us were from chicago or detroit um and then the other folks that weren't from those cities had been familiar with the music so it wasn't like that far of a, a change so that was amazing so we just celebrated um last year was the 25th year you know, um, you know, I love this. You got a doctoral degree, but <laughs> did you do a little booty shake music? Yeah, that was part of it. Right. <laughs> we still get down and don't trip because like New Orleans is all about the twerk. So like, Look, we, we were like, yes, <laughs> like, 
so many it's funny because like during over quarantine Manny Fresh has said like we had a um I think it was during one of our um virtual homecomings and he said you are a pharmacist and a twerker like it yeah, comes it's, like it's you can get you both like it can be a good balance. I love it <laughs> if, if I would be embarrassed if some of the films of the the dance routines we used to do in high school if, yes. if, if there was film of that stuff uh, it would be hard to explain what, what what we were thinking that day. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And we were taking stuff from like some of the colleges too, because people would come back and be like, okay, we got this routine for you. And be like, <laughs> what are we doing? Like, yeah, hilarious. Oh, so gr ground me, because this dance is a, a significant part of, you, in terms of formal training, what what kind of, were you tap, ballet, jazz? Like what, how were you introduced to dance? And what did that, did that developmental experience look like for you? Yeah, I think I've always been into music. And then, like I said, our our block, like our the neighborhood I grew up in, we had a bunch of different families on the block. And one of the, the families that I grew up with are the Stones. So Beverly Stone had um, a dance studio called MBS that was up on Livernois on the west side of Detroit. And our family, like I basically grew up with the whole family. And so when... Um, Mrs. Stone started this dance school. I think my mom was trying to find something for me to do. Yeah. And oh, she yeah. ended up putting me in dance. And so um, it was ballet, tap, and jazz. And, and we did do gymnastics for a while. Um, but then most of us got like taller than most of the teachers. And it was like, all right, y'all are too big for us to be, be trying to flip y'all around. So um, for the most part, it was ballet, tap, and jazz that I was um, trained in. All right. And then, and then the parallel, because we're going we're gonna to bridge over into the, the professional accomplishments. So a, after the undergraduate degree, and was it in chemistry, biology, or what, what did you end up finishing? It was out environmental with? chemistry. Okay. Yeah. And then you bridged into a master's degree in a, doc, in a doctoral program. Like what, what were the stair steps in that process from, okay, I finished college, but, but, but I, mm -hmm. I want to learn more, or I don't feel qualified enough, or what was the decision-making process to enroll you back into school? So, yeah, so I ended up, I did a summer program at the University of Notre Dame between my, I, it, so talking about the social like opportunities in New Orleans, I am not perfect, far from it. It took me five years to finish college, right? And so part of that was the shift in changing majors. So in changing majors, I had a summer between my fourth and fifth year where I, I had an opportunity to do research, biochemistry research at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. And it was absolutely life-changing. Um, really? Just found out that the my mentor, Dr. Basu, passed away um, last year, but he provided like insight about biochemistry in labs that I hadn't really experienced. And so that gave me insight again on like seeing somebody seeing this Indian, like this Indian man who's absolutely amazing and genius, invite this black woman into his lab and give him like, give me like free reign to understand um, this enzyme that we were looking at. It was great. So I thought, okay, I can do this. I'm going to go back and pursue a PhD in biochemistry. And so I ended up applying that last year of school and I applied to two universities. I got into both. But going back to Notre Dame and interviewing, it was a really interesting experience. And I think some of the microaggressions that we experienced in some yeah. of these interviews, like it wasn't called microaggressions then, right? It was yeah. just kind of like, trust your gut, Jackie. Like those questions that they're asking you, they're not asking everybody else, right? So um, I ended up at the University of Cincinnati um, in a PhD yeah. in biochemistry. And so this was like 2000. Um, and it wasn't a good fit for me. I switched from semesters to quarters. Um, I was living in back in, I was in back in the Midwest. I have friends that were in Cincinnati, um, but it was also around the time that there was a high incidence of police brutality in the city. And so a black man was killed while I was there and Cincinnati rioted. And it was a really interesting experience because I didn't even know like that we were rioting that people were writing. Right, because you're a doctoral had, student. Yeah, well, I was a doctoral student and I had just come from out of town. I got a call asking me, was I okay? Because they saw on the news, all this stuff was happening. So it ended up being um, a good transition for me because it wasn't the, the university, the program wasn't a good fit for me. Um, I did not do very well in transitioning to quarters and like everything moved just like super fast. So... I took, I went to the career um, services 
department in at the University of Cincinnati, which like doesn't happen as much as it used to anymore. That's a whole different discussion we could have on how much we're paying for school and not necessarily getting the services that we need. But I was able to take a career assessment that told me I should look at health administration or hospital administration. So I called up one of my mentors, Dr. Derek Rivera, and said, hey, doc, like, this is what I got from this career assessment. What do you think? He was like, oh, yeah, here are the master's degrees in health administration that you should apply to. Gave me the names, gave me, got me connected, and I talked to those folks and got into two schools again, <laughs> interviewed. And one of the programs they wanted to, it was a more of a master's in public health, which doesn't provide as much as the as much of the financial and strategic understanding of kind of health administration and what goes along with that. And that's really an important piece um, of the work. So I ended up going to St. Louis University um, to pursue my master's degree in health administration um, at, the, at the School of, of Public Health. And so another Catholic university, um, mm -hmm. it wasn't my intent to be connected to Catholic universities like that, but it was a good fit for me. Um, and then I ended up having two internship opportunities while I was um, at St. Louis University, um, started my career in health administration um, and put the, I had really put the PhD DRPH on pause. Like I was like, I'm good. Like <laughs> I'm not going back to school. And then the Affordable Care Act came about in 2010. Oh, which. And so in my work, like I was the director for a psychiatric practice group at the time. And so I'm talking to my bosses and we all had a conversation with our governmental affairs, our lawyers at the time. And they were like, yeah, so this is what the policy is stating. Right. And so they can translate. Lawyers can translate it for you um, as far as what the policy means and like what they're trying to say. But we could not get them to operationalize that. And so that's when I started realizing it might be time to go back to school because there's no there's not a lot of opportunity to kind of bridge the gap between the policy yeah. and actually operationalizing that work. And so seeing how important and what the attempts of what the ACA was trying to do, it was important for me to go back to be able to help translate and be one of those bridges that could help to provide that insight. Yeah, the, the, the multidisciplinary approach that it, that's, that's required to make these, these policy decisions effective, that, that, that's making me think about some of the maybe the the twists and turns that your career path took. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some people realize when they're young, specifically what they want to be, and they just kind of get started marching their way to that career path. Right. Uh, but, it, but it sounds like that wasn't necessarily true for you, that you, within, within some guardrails, you kind of bounced around to a couple different things uh, before yeah. finding an, an eventual place. What, were those transitions motivating? Were they uh, marginalizing, depressing? Like, what did you think as you know, you were incrementally changing from one thing to the next to the next, or did or did it all kind of feel like there was synergy and you were headed into a goal that you know was revealing itself along the way? No, I think it was it was difficult. Like it wasn't easy. So to start out like thinking that you're going to be a doctor, and then like this shift happens where it's like, okay, I can be in this space of chemistry or public health. I think a lot. I have to credit my mentors and like my like front rows that have always been there to be supportive of like some of the things that I'm thinking about like and I, I had a conversation about this yesterday like or earlier this week the fact that like I used to have conversations with folks and say hey what do you think about this get their insight and then keep it moving but like now like I'm more much more comfortable in the space of having the conversation and listening in a very different way because if somebody says oh you sure you want to do that? I have to like be ready for kind of the dissenters, right? But like having having that insight and getting being open to the critiques, I think has been super helpful in making those transitions. Some of them have been just leaps. Like I haven't there have been jobs that I haven't stayed in for longer than a year, right? Because they weren't a good fit. I It's all about like, it was a lot of times about me trusting my gut and being comfortable and leaning in in that space mm -hmm. and not doubting that like what was going on was not right and it wasn't a good fit for me. So it it, it has been interesting, but 
most of it has been strategic. Like I really had to yeah. sit down and have conversations and really put a lot of thought into, does this make sense? And especially after going back, I went back full time to pursue my, my DRPH. Right. So, okay. so you had that, I had a lot you... of time. I had a lot of time to think about things. And I knew that like whatever next step that I would take, it would have to be strategic. And it can't, I can't be in a space of like hopping around all yeah. the time. Cause one, I'm getting older. And then on top of that, like there are certain places, I think in, in part of that experience of like, going through various roles and opportunities there are places that i now know that i won't move right, as a result right, right. of my experience right yeah. Yeah, so those, that's important to consider too those doctoral degrees to, to, to in the cases where students are going full time right it's at the it, you have to sacrifice income for that time period in, in a lot of cases maybe, maybe yeah. in some cases you might have a fellowship that you know right. keeps your, your quality of life and living um at, at a higher place but uh, for many others, it, it is uh, stepping outside of an income earning uh, role yes. uh, and, and more to a student, uh, maybe debt incurring uh, yep. position. Uh, yep. uh, so you, you 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 made it to a, a specific place, but I, I want to touch on your your research to earn a doctoral degree. Like, likely mm -hmm. you have to do a dissertation. What yep. What is it that you studied for your dissertation? So the purpose of my study was it, it was a mixed method study, and I wanted to really understand like how nationally like we're utilizing healthcare, but like mainly I was interested in understanding how we use inpatient facilities to really understand the physical and behavioral comorbidities within these inpatient facilities from like 2010 to 2015. So like I mentioned, like the ACA kind of went into effect 2010. So like looking at this data. So it was a healthcare cost and utilization project, and it's called HCUP for short. It was like a national inpatient sample and just understanding how people are using the hospital now that like supposedly, you know, folks yeah. are, are covered, right? They're now covered with insurance plans. How does that look now, especially with, and I was looking at for um, specific conditions. So diabetes, congestive heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And then also, um, I think those were the three. And then I was also looking at folks that had, um, di well, had depression as a comorbidity. So are they staying longer? Are they using more money? Like, is the cost of utilization up? What does it look like? Because I don't think that there have been a lot of studies to see if yeah. this increase in coverage meant utilization or cost were going to be more controlled or if it was going to be increased as a result of more people have people having coverage that's super interesting so to some degree to more, more the population has has health insurance so what's walking in the door is it this diagnosis or that one or combinations of things where is it older people younger people uh, ethnicity what what now walks in the door now that more people have health care yeah so i I did break it out. I think I did break it out by race and age. Um, but overall, we found that like length of stay was longer for people yeah. that had the mood disorder um, as a comorbidity. So like they're not their first diagnosis, but like the second diagnosis or or some people come in and have 11 diagnoses. Right. But like if they're if they had depression in like anywhere outside of that first place, we included that data. So they stayed longer. Um, they actually had a lower percentage of costs for diabetes, a higher percentage of costs for chronic um, congestive heart failure, and then it was four percent higher for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So you've got like a lot of money <laughs> being spent. Yeah. Um, in these spaces or um, because a lot of health plans now may have incentivized hospitals and even the patients, um, the diabetes costs could have been lower just because of arrangements and agreements that could be happening within within the hospital um, and other factors that we don't necessarily see in that data. Now, why is it that you want to study that? You mentioned that the Affordable uh, Care Act, that introduction kind of created new space and opportunity to, to look at different things. But yeah. was there something, and, and for me, it's always back to your childhood. Is there something from your, from your, from your life's path yeah. uh, that 
kind of brought that to you the forefront as something that you were specifically interested in? Yeah, so I took a course in my doctorate program um, that was I there were a couple courses that were kind of eye opening. And one of the research projects that I looked at at the time was kidney failure. Okay. Um, and and this was around the time um, my dad had been dealing with some severe kidney issues. And so yeah. that um, put it into light for me. And so actually during my program in 2015, my father passed away from multiple cancers. And so like understanding like his struggle and even like the way in which he utilized the healthcare system that had an impact and like knowing that there were probably chronic issues that weren't addressed that then exacerbated like the cancers and um, just his quality of life, that really had an impact. And I think also just from my work experience um, as a hospital administrator, understanding the impact that a psychiatric diagnosis can have on people as well, like the length of stay, their experience as a whole in the hospital can really be impacted. So like using personal experience, but on top of that, like knowing um, and and seeing some of the, the f- fallout of, uh, is probably not the best word, but seeing the examples of how chronic and comorbid conditions can have an impact on like the way in which individuals live their lives because their quality of life can be compromised, being in a hospital is prob- is part of the reason why I really wanted to look at um, understanding these diagnoses because they're expensive. Like we, we spend yeah. a lot of money um, attempting to try to address these issues. Yeah, and, and not, not that I've heard this story and not, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some details from beginning to get, from beginning to end, but from the dance classes to marching band to Xavier, uh, organic chemistry, some, some rigor academically and just trying to find, find your best place and the inspiration in your, your internship or, or the fellowship you did, were, were able to do at another university and b- bouncing around. And, and this makes you, this, all this dance and performance makes you a people person. Uh, so thank <laughs> goodness that you arrived into a, 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 p- a public health advocacy role uh, because mm-hmm. of your heart and connection with performance and people. Um, and then bringing the science along with that to mobilize all that different stuff. Uh, right, uh, right. Into, uh, an effective career and to help people. Um, you mentioned one more thing uh, in our prior conversation that I want to bring out, uh, and your your mom as a women's advocate. Can you tell me yeah. about your background and experience with your mother and any community work that your that your mother did growing up? Yeah, so I think um, I come from a long line of amazing women in leadership, right? And it's not like my mom has definitely like blazed a path. Um, And it's interesting because like as a kid, I used to go with her to a lot of these meetings and say, I used to tell her, I'm not going with you. Like, (laughs) I don't wanna go with you, but I learned the city. Like I ended up learning the city of Detroit just by like riding around with her in the car, going to these random meetings, right? And I told her I would never be as involved as she is, but look at me now, like (laughs) I've been involved with like a number of different organizations, Um, but, my um my mom has been involved she was um i remember going to like ywca board meetings the federation of girls homes was a um another organi- organization she was involved with um our sorority delta sigma theta sorority she's been um she was a chapter president for detroit okay, and okay. one time for um, the deltas yeah <laughs> Hey, Soros, yes, for sure. So she's been she's been engaged and involved, but part of that, I think, well, not just part of it, I think her growing up in my grandmother's household, my grandmother was really involved in the civil rights movement. Um, she was uh one of the, I think the first black woman elected to an at-large board seat at, um with the Detroit Board of Education. Um, so there's always and she actually went back to college after all her kids graduated from college. So like amazing, yeah, amazing stories from like the women that I have been like around and raised, like the way that they raised me. And then even my godmother um, was also heavily engaged in in Detroit um, and Detroit politics. Um, She was a public school teacher, but then ended up being a superintendent, uh, assistant superintendent by the time she left. Um, Detroit Public Schools, but then also involved with the Carter administration in the 70s. 
Um, and there are just so many, like the Black United Fund, she was involved with like a lot of, um, a lot of different opportunities that put women in the forefront and like lifted up opportunities for women to lead, which um, especially my my godmother, um, Dr. Bernadine Didding, Denning, she grew up in the 30s. So even hey, her doc, thought your process, grandmother, your grandmother, doctor. No, my my godmother. Your godmother. Okay. My god my godmother had an um an EDD, so a, a educational doc, a doctorate in education. Okay. Um my my grandmother was Claire Rutherford. She did not have a, a doctorate degree. She had she did finish her bachelor's. Um, like I said, after all of her her kids had finished. So education was a big deal. And not just I'm not just gonna say my my the women in my family, even my maternal grandfather was an advocate for education, one of the smartest people that I know. Um, my grandfather was always pushing me <laughs> to get like, he's like, baby, you always in school, which was true for a while. Um, but he was always like super supportive of, um, of education. And I think told all of his descendants how important that was. And then also my godfather um, who worked at Ford Motor Company all his life, but um, the way that he had a skill with numbers was unbelievable. Yeah. Like his, his ability to like, remember the most random dates and like phone numbers and everything yeah. else. Like uncle Don was, was one of the realists, but that was old Detroit. Right. So I got a combination of like old Detroit um, folks that may not have necessarily gone the route of school, but they had the business sense and common sense in, in addition to like encouraging me and, and telling me how important education was. So like that, that balance has really helped, I think, to be able to try to contribute and make a difference. Yeah, there, there's no way a person earns a doctoral degree without really valuing ed education and, and have people <laughs> aligned and supporting them because right, that, that, that's school on top of school on top of school. And, and it's valuable, but it's-, yeah. it's, it, it's But it's not for everybody. And I- don't push folks like if they don't want to do it or they may be they may be in a program and they may just need a break like that's OK, too. But is school is not for everybody. And that's OK. And especially now, as expensive as it is. Yeah. Mm -mm, like the trades, like all of that, like there's so many other options to make a decent amount of money and probably more money than most folks that have kind of gone that like you know, normal college, grad school, you know, route, like there's, there's, there are just so many different opportunities. So parents don't feel like you have to have it. The kids have to have it all together. Cause that's not, yeah. school is not for everybody. And, I, and I'm glad this is the, maybe the final thing. I'm glad you caught out for me, your, your specific development in, in an art, because for all, all of the, the STEM professionals that I talked to, so many of them have it's not just a, a lazy interest in the arts. It was like a, a crafted, like punctuated development in the arts. Mm -hmm. um, so 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 that, that seems to be a commonality across the board. Um, yeah, I, I just find it sad now that like, especially growing up in Detroit, like we had access to arts and music in elementary school, right? And like they yeah. cut those budgets. Like that's not provided, I don't think in the same way in which we had it growing up, which is unfortunate because that's where a lot of us, while we may be like in the books, we were also, we had an outlet, right? We had right. those outlets to be able to perform, to be able to improvise, whatever, like that gave us additional outlets. And I, I find it unfortunate that like, you have to have, again, you have to have the money to be able to pay for like private lessons or yeah. have a really good friend that's gonna, that's gonna hook you up with like, lessons pro bono but yeah it I think it most of us in that stem space it was some sort of art or sport or some 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 outlet that they have yes sure. so they think and god bless all the young people that could do a tiktok dance they know all the tiktok dances <laughs> uh but they also do well in school because the, the combination of the two things can can yield awesome results over a lifetime they, the, yep. the two things work hand in hand to produce uh really effective people uh, absolutely so, Thank you, Dr. Orr. I learned, I learned, gosh, I learned so much about you today. I'm happy. Yeah, I'm glad that I could share. Like, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this random and like 
interesting story of mine. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and to all the viewers, thank you so much for following. If you could like this video and follow our YouTube channel, we would really appreciate it. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today.